The essence of Buddhist psychology is that it is taught as a psychology for liberation, to discover in ourselves how we can become free or experience an inner freedom in the midst of all the things of life. And what's important in talking about this that I want to somehow convey is that it's not a philosophy that you kind of add some new Eastern concepts, hip Buddhist things to your understanding. It really has a purpose of looking at one's own life and using it in some way uh, to find an inner freedom, very immediate and very real. It's like the breath. We sit and work with the breath, especially on retreats and longer practice. And first people say, well, I'm breathing, so, (laughs) so what? But then somebody will call me and say, you know, I went in the hospital for an operation or an emergency or something, and I'm so grateful that I knew how to center myself and work with the attention to my breath. It's like it saved their life. Or the Zen master whose student went and complained and said, you know, being aware of the breath is boring. Don't you have any more interesting meditations? (laughs) And he grabbed the student and pushed him under the stream and held him down there. And he was struggling and trying to get out for a long time. Finally, after a minute or more, he let him out. And he looked at him and he said, how was it? And the student said, terrible, I couldn't breathe. And the Zen master said, was your breath interesting then? (laughs) So the purpose of these descriptions are really to come to ourselves in a direct way, our experience. Now in other kinds of spiritual practice, many kinds, like in the 12-step work that some people may be involved in, there's also the injunction, if you will, to look at one's own life honestly, to do a true looking, tell one's story directly, to do a searching moral inventory of one's life. We were talking about studying, grasping, and wanting, and the hole in us that we try to fill up with all these different things, as if they would do it if you got the right food and relationship and money and all these things, then you would, you know, get that and then you'd be complete and you wouldn't want anything else. Right? This is the poet Kabir. He writes, I said to the wanting creature inside of me, you know who that is, what is this river you want to cross? Do you believe there is some other place that will make the soul less thirsty? In that great absence, you will find nothing. What we seek is here already. Be strong then and enter your own body. There you have a solid place for your feet. Kabir says this, Just throw away all thoughts of imaginary things not yet come and stand firm in that which you are. So one studies, if you look, at wanting, and is it the thing itself that satisfies, or what's your relationship to that wanting creature that Kabir speaks of? In Buddhist psychology, then, there is other unwise strategies. We talked about delusion and aversion, just as the greed or wanting is based on a sense of insufficiency. The next is the sense of aversion, aggression, hatred, pushing away the world. One is trying to get more and the other is to push it away. In the texts of the Buddha's words, it begins, the very first verse in the Dhammapada is, mind is the forerunner of all things. As we think and act, so our world becomes. So if we're going to look at aggression or hatred or fear or aversion, all those things that push the world away, remember the story of the man who wandered around the world looking for happiness. And he tried various places and various activities and nothing was quite right for him. He was an aversion temperament, if you will. Nothing would quite do it. And he went from place to place and activity to activity trying to be happy with what was there. Finally, he kind of gave up. He was wandering in a forest and he saw a great tree and he sat down exhausted. Enough of this search. 
What he didn't know was that he had sat under the tree named Kalpatru, which is the great wish-fulfilling tree. So as he sat there, he thought, maybe it's better not to want so much. This is very pleasant, just sitting here in this valley, in the forest under the tree. But he thought, if I were to stay here, I'd need some place to live. It'd be nice to stay here, if only I had a little cottage. And the wanting came back in, as you can see. And he turned around, and there appeared a cottage, magically. Ah, oh, wonderful. He thought, but I am a bit tired from my travels. It would be good to have some food and drink. And as soon as the thought came, he noticed outside the cottage a great table laid with all this food and drink. Went over and began to eat and drink. Feel quite happy from that. But then he got a little bit tired from doing that. He said, it would be nice if there was someone to serve it. And sure enough, out of the cottage came a butler to kind of offer the food to him, sit down, make him really comfortable. And when he'd finished very pleasantly, he thought, well, I could move here for a long time, but I might get a little lonely. It would be nice if there were a partner here. door of the cottage opened and out came a lovely woman who beckoned to him in a friendly way, said, please, it'd be a pleasure to, you know, stay together. He kind of enjoyed that for a bit, and was sitting there. <laughs> and then feeling kind of replete, his desires fulfilled for the moment, he looked around and he said, you know, this is very odd. I've been wanting things everywhere, and finally here I sit under this great tree, and as soon as I think of something, it comes. Maybe there's something about the tree Maybe there's some kind of spirit or who knows what that lives in it. Maybe there's some kind of goblin, ghost. And no sooner had he thought maybe there's some ghost or goblin than it appeared. And then he thought, oh, maybe it will come and eat me up. And it did. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Mind is the forerunner of all things. With our thoughts and actions, we create our world. So in Buddhist psychology, one tendency in the unskillful ways of reacting is to grasp. The opposite is aversion, the aversion type. Remember, we talked about personality types, who enters the room and looks around and sees what's wrong with it. You know, it's too hot, too many people, I don't like these kind of people anyway, and the food isn't quite right, and their relation to the world is to see what's wrong with it. And in that temperament or that type, they tend to eat hastily and quickly, it says in the texts, and they walk rapidly to get it done, you know, stiffly, and there's a sense of trying to protect or conquer or judge the world as they move through it. Now, through the practice of mindfulness and meditation we do, we become aware of the different states within us, because everyone has all of these states. And without judging it, you can just begin to study this force, this reaction, the instinct to push away of aversion, aggression, hatred, fear. What is it to observe or sense its working, its causes, how it feels in a moment? And this is not a small force. Aversion, aggression, hatred. It makes wars, terrible fights in the world. Worldwide sorrow for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. 115 wars since World War II. And there's only 170 countries. Not a very good track record as a species. You know? Violence in our own streets becoming really prevalent, isn't it? So what is this force? If you look, it is actually a strategy for safety. People trying to make themselves safe in some way. Yet it's rooted in separateness. Just as in wanting, there's this hole that we try to fill up. We feel separate from the world. And if we get enough stuff and things and whatever, then we'll feel whole or safe. This is the opposite. But it's also a strategy to find safety, to find strength. 
by pushing the world away with aggression or aversion. And yet it's big forces. In ancient Ireland, the early inhabitants of Ireland fended off invaders through magical poetic incantations that caused the ocean waves to churn and push away invading ships before they could reach the shore. And this is an old Irish poem. The Irish poet Césaire attempted to defend her homeland by using a powerful verse to halt the invasion of the poet warrior Amergin. So this is their battle in poetry. Amergin begins... I plant my foot on this land, for I am Amergen, son of the people of the sea, prince of the white cave, son of the builder of the spiral castle. He goes on, I am the roar of the sea, I am the bull of seven fights, I am a hawk on a cliff, I rove the hills a ravening boar, I am lightning that blasts the trees, I am the point of weapons, I am the thunder on the mountains, I am a god that fashions fire for a head, I'm a dragon that eats the sky. And Césaire answers him, Here I stand, daughter of the moon, Césaire, poet of Arianhod, daughter of Diane, the mother and queen, daughter of the northwest wind, mistress on the shore, daughter of darkness. I am the flash of sun on water. I am the blood of wild beasts. I am the fire in the witch's hearth. I am the evening sky ablaze, the red of serpents' tongues, the black of deepest night. I am a mare that knows no rains. I thread the stars across the sky. I am the kiss of lovers' lips. I am the mortar and the stone. I am the song of my homeland. I won't tell you who won. (laughs) They'll look that up. But these are not just kind of psychological descriptions. They're really the forces that govern human life around the world. And they're great, and they deserve a lot of respect. Now, in our society, the models for strength are primarily models of domination, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt, you know, and the troops in the Caribbean. Remember, we've been going to the Caribbean a long time with our troops. You know, or John Wayne, President Reagan, or the kind of glorification of domination and violence in television. It's become unbelievable how much violence we feed ourselves visually. And the violence that's growing on our streets. And there's very few wise elders, and there's very few examples of strength that also involves wisdom and flexibility and respect rather than domination. So we want to feel safe. We all do, and we look to discover strength through often aggression, aversion, which is to say that we feel insecure, vulnerable, and that is our basic human state. Anybody not? Raise your hand. I want to meet you. And I wouldn't believe it anyway, probably. How do we deal with that vulnerability? Is that who we really are? We take it to be ourselves. In Buddhist psychology, the amount of fear we have is equal to the amount of our separateness. The more separate we feel, the more fear there will be. The more we sense ourselves as separate and solid and rigid, and this is who I am, my body, my territory, my ideas, my beliefs, the more of that the more we need to support it and protect it and defend it and control other things or conquer them or get things done our way, the more rigid our life becomes when that state becomes a prevalent response. Again, not trying to be theoretical. I grew up in my own house with a father who was violent and uh, aggressive, and he would have bouts of rage regularly and was pretty abusive, mostly to my mother. He didn't hit us much, but I remember her hiding bottles, quart bottles, behind curtains in each room so that when he came to grab her, she could go for a bottle to defend herself. Now, when he would 
try to throw her down the stairs, which he did sometimes, or take her out for a drive and throw on the brakes of the car so she would maybe hit her head in the windshield because she wasn't doing what he wanted, you know. And she often was black and blue from their fights. It was the way they connected, actually. It's interesting. And it became very interesting as a child to watch this. It was terrifying. And I tried to be very good and peaceful. I'm still trying to do it to kind of <laughs> keep them from fighting so much, right? But that was their main form of contact, was through fighting. And when I look now, what I see is how much pain there was. That underneath all that was an enormous amount of pain and an enormous amount of fear. That's really what was there. So when anger and hatred and resentment and aversion and aggression arise, begin to be mindful of it. Study it in your life. When does it happen? What are the circumstances, the instinct for it, the habit? How does it arise? And if you pay attention, you will begin to notice some things, kind of ex- keys to examine. There will be experiences, a sight or a sound or a smell or a taste, something that happens to you, some event, probably a painful one, but who knows. Some sense experience that you respond to with anger or aggression. And if you pay attention to the moment before that response, you will feel either most likely some form of pain that you're hurt or that there's grief or something in there that is awfully difficult to feel. And then you respond in anger. Or you might discover there's fear. Fear of loss, fear of hurt, fear of being embarrassed, fear of shame, fear of your own weakness, of not knowing. And so, not feeling that, we respond often with aggression or anger. So when you begin to pay attention, you can notice the pain or the fear or the embarrassment or what's there prior to it, that it's really a defense against. As we become mindful, another way becomes possible in this psychology. What would happen if we were mindful and stopped, somehow softened, and just felt the pain or the fear? Suppose my father could have said, instead of what he did, I'm terrified, which he was a lot, or I'm in such pain, Oh, it hurts so much. There's so much grief. Suppose he could have said that. Instead, what kind of conversation would have happened? If we can acknowledge what is there prior to that response and speak the truth about it from our heart, all kinds of other things begin to happen. It's kind of respect for ourselves and it's a vulnerability to do that. So this is a way to begin to examine, to untangle it. Now, in working with hatred and aggression and so forth, we need to acknowledge the clarity that comes with it. Sometimes we're seeing with a lot of clarity, the kind of sword of Manjusri, the Buddha image that carries the sword that cuts through illusion. And very often when we respond to the world in this way, with this state, What we're seeing is the Buddha's first noble truth, the truth of suffering. That there are so many sorrows in this world. Disappointment, loss, injustice, terrible things that people do to one another, a fundamental insecurity of our life that's true, that no one can do anything about. Our separateness, And then the big and final disappointment or fear that we have of death itself. So when we look at life as it presents itself to us, the question is, in our hearts, can we accept the truth of it? The pain that we share in being alive, the 10,000 joys and beauties of life, and the 10,000 sorrows and losses and griefs. Anyone not have that, not share that pain? Can we accept the incompleteness, the imperfection, even the horrors of it in some way? 
Because if we can't, if we can't grieve, if we can't see it and feel it, we will constantly be at war against life the way that it is. Carrying on the battle. And our streets become violent because they are streets, as my friend Maladoma says, filled with the ungrieved dead because we haven't really honored the kinds of sacrifices that racism, poverty, and so forth have exacted upon so many people in our culture. So if you want to deal with this force, if we do in meditation or in our lives, it's not a simple thing or an easy one. It really means facing those facts about the world. We long to discover safety or fulfillment. And this strategy of aversion in this psychology is either to contract out of fear or to attack. Cruelty, writes Carlos Fuentes, cruelty is a failure of the imagination. We can't imagine anything else but that kind of protection. So how to understand and work with this? Just as in the grasping and wanting, we talked about finding the whole and the belief that we can fill it up, what will make us whole, as if something outside would do it. How old do we feel with that wanting? In this opposite, aversion, anger, we start to study it in our bodies and minds, sense its destructive power. There's a text from the Bodhisattva's way that the Dalai Lama taught last year in this country, Shantideva's text. And in one part of it, Shantideva writes, a moment of anger or aggression can undo eons of gifts and blessings. That anger is the true enemy, the internal destroyer, the corrosive element within us. Now, when that text was first taught, and I remember the Dalai Lama teaching it some years ago, he was very adamant about that. And there's a truth to it. The last time he taught it, or one of the last times he taught it, he said that and he said, "Mm, I'm not so sure exactly how to teach this because he said some of the American psychologists and people have been talking to him, telling him that stuffing your anger is also not good. So he said, maybe possible some circumstances better to express. It's kind of interesting. William Blake wrote, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. That is to say, we can learn from anger and the point isn't to suppress it, but to discover this very powerful, intense energy that it is. So what is it? The anger that comes or the aversion, or the aggression, or the hatred, at pain, at hurt, at fear. What happens to us? And if we repeat it, it becomes crystallized as hatred and leads to aggression. And when I looked in myself after some years of meditation, what I found was, after being quiet and good and trying to make peace for a long time, that anger was so scary to me because of the environment I grew up in, I really didn't let myself feel it. I didn't know how much I had. And I discovered that I was filled with it. And I had a couple of years in practice and inner work that it started to come out and it was just rage. And the rage was really at the pain that I'd carried and the pain that I'd seen and the pain of the world. So I began to look, how big is it? As big as a volcano, as big as a nuclear explosion. And I just began to pay attention to the pain that I carried and the response to it. How much do you carry? Langston Hughes wrote a poem called Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, fester like a sore, stink like rotten meat? Or does it explode, he asks. Or Robert Frost Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice 
is also great and would suffice. So we begin to pay attention with respect. You bow to it. You say, how big is it? What is this instinct? What have I been taught? What is my habit? What do I do with the pain that I carry or the grief or the fear? And what are the responses? Or you pay attention to the fear. Fearful consciousness arises. Sights come, sounds come. What is fear? Another of these demons. Anybody really look at what fear is? Does something in your body? Hands sweaty, breath stops. But if you look like that demon story, fear is primarily imagination. Pay attention to it. If you notice carefully, we are never afraid of what's here. We're always afraid of something yet to come. We may not like what's here. Maybe something that's very painful or unpleasant, but the fear is what's going to happen next. It's the story we tell ourselves. So if you're walking in the Sierras, and all of a sudden you see bear tracks, fear comes, maybe, right? But it's not the tracks that are the problem, it's the story, what's going to happen. Then you see the bear, and then again you get more afraid, but it's not seeing the bear that's the problem. Then the bear runs toward you and grabs you, okay, (laughs) and bites your arm. Now, is that fearful? It's not. It hurts, you don't like it. What you're scared of is what it's going to bite next, right? (laughs) And it bites somewhere else. And then you're still scared, not of that. That's painful, it's horrible. But you're not afraid of that. You're afraid of what's going to happen when you die or whatever. The fear is always a story about something else. So study your fear, begin to pay attention. Here we are and then we tell a story. Do you believe your stories? Hmm? Another question. Your worry and fear, what good is it to you? Does it serve you? Does it really help you? Is there skillful worry? Maybe you could call it planning. (laughs) You need to sort these out. I mean, this is not, you know, some cookie cutter thing. This is understanding what's wise and what's not. But all those stories. How about judgment, the judging mind? Anybody have the judging mind come in their life? We judge the world. We judge ourselves so much. We're so hard on ourselves. We have very little mercy, especially to us. And it comes again and again and again. Can you sense that state? This is no good and you're no good and that action is no good and that is... Where did you learn that? Whose voice is that? Oh, I remember her, him, right? Thank you for your opinion. I appreciate it. You can identify the voice. You can give it a name. Joyce, thank you. You (laughs) Thanks for your opinion. Or you can count it. How many judgments in an hour? And I don't like this and that, and I'm judging that too. I shouldn't know. That's 14, you know. Oh, but I'm getting good at counting them. 15, right? (laughs) And you just see the judging mind for what it is. There's pain. There's fear. There's judgment. It is what it is. Is that who we are? Or blame. Blame. Judgment and blame because the world is imperfect. We feel impatient with it. Really comes out of our own fear and isolation, our own grief, our loss of connection with ourself. And we blame others. We judge ourselves. So what Buddhist psychology begins to ask of us is to become aware, awake to these forces. And we're starting, as I said, with the unwise ones, then we'll get to the wise ones. The experiences of pleasant and unpleasant and neutral come. And when they arise, especially the unpleasant ones, painful ones, which everybody has, praise and blame and hot and cold and and pleasure and pain and joy and sorrow, they come and go. And when we receive them with a small sense of self, with the body of fear, and there are these strategies to hide our vulnerability. There comes the wanting mind or aggression or judgment. What does it mean to be mindful of it? The Buddha says, in that moment, be aware of your body. What does aggression feel like in your body or anger? You get rigid or what does it do to your breath? How does fear feel physically? Is it pleasant? 
anger pleasant? Then pay attention in your heart. What is there? Insecurity? Impotence? Shame? Rage? What are the rhythms? What touches them? Sense it in your mind. What are the stories that it tells? He did that, she did, they will never, this happen. You know the stories. What are the beliefs? I will be hurt, I will die, if they don't, I will lose. I will. You can look at all of that with a mindful attention. Now, is there some other way? Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, in a description of this Buddhist psychology, talked about there being a house with six square windows in it, small windows, and a mad monkey inside, rushing from the window of sight to the window of sound to the window of taste, one to another. (laughs) Always wanting the right sight at the window, getting unhappy if it doesn't have bananas or whatever it wants, you know, pounding on the walls, or leering out the window looking for the things that it does want. And the house is kind of this territory. So there's either the wanting or there are the guards at each door saying, you can come in and you can't. So he talked about that in one lecture, sort of a description of how we all have tried everything to get the right experience to stay, to enhance, to protect, to collect the right things, to avoid the painful ones. We do it all the time. And so people were asking the questions, well, does the monkey ever slow down? He said, no. What does it look like out his windows? The world looks very flat and square, he says. Then somebody raised their hand. I remember this lecture. He said, well, what happens to the monkey when he takes LSD? And Chogyam Trumpa answered, he's already taken it. It didn't help. If you want to study this aspect of your own psychology and the psychology of the world, sense how much pain or fear or loss or grief there is when the moments of anger or aggression or judgment come. Just notice what's there with it. And as you begin to be mindful, to be aware, it allows for a shift of identity right away to make space for what is greater than those stories and feelings. To rest in the knowing, in the one who knows in us, that wise place that's seen it all. If there's been a consistent criticism of Nelson Mandela over the years, this was from Time magazine, it is that he's too willing to see the good in people. If this is a flaw, it is one he accepts because it grows out of his great strength, his generosity of heart toward his enemies. He defends himself by noting that thinking too well of people sometimes makes them behave better than they otherwise would. He believes in the essential goodness of the human heart, even though he has spent a lifetime suffering the wounds of heartless people around him. So to become aware is like Nelson Mandela, who came with such dignity and grace out of 25 years of prison. It's as if we too can find that place of a deeper knowing. And we can feel the body of fear you know, in the stories of ourself. He did this, he beat me, he robbed me. It says, as the Buddha says, if you live in those thoughts and perpetuate them, hatred never ceases. Abandon that perspective. Step outside of that. Hatred never ceases by hatred. So one sits to find or remember a strength of heart, the true strength of our being to remember another possibility, which is a strength that's not in opposition. We think that strength is to be opposed to something. But that's not real strength. That's kind of cheap, actually. It always depends on something else. True strength is in our being, is being grounded on the earth. It's like those beautiful Irish poems. It is the strength of knowing who we are, of being in this moment connected with our true nature, our Buddha nature. So the Buddha sat and said, I consider the positions of kings and rulers as that of dust motes. I see the treasures of gold and gems as broken tiles. I look upon the finest silken robes as tattered rags. I see the myriad worlds of the universe as small seeds 
and the great Indian Ocean is a drop of oil at my foot. I perceive the teachings of the world to be the illusions of magicians, haven't you noticed? I look upon the judgment of right and wrong as the serpentine dance of a dragon and the rise and fall of beliefs as but traces left by the four seasons. To rest in that place that sees birth and death and joy and sorrow and where there's a deep knowing that we all participate in the pain and the beauty of life. That's the source of compassion. Whether it's for my father or the people in Sarajevo, for the killers and the killed alike. At a men's retreat, which we had on the absence of elders and the violence of youth down in Los Angeles, a number of wonderful teachers. There were men who just came out of prison after years of being in prison. There were youth gangs, Latino, African American, a whole collection, kind of multiracial, multicultural. And we were talking about what makes violence and what role models we had and how few there were that were wise. And finally, one guy stood up. We were just telling stories and trying to speak honestly. There was also meditation, chanting, and the other ritual practices. And one man stood up and he said, you know, he said this European-American guy, he said, I'm really scared of the violence. I live in L.A. and after the riots, and it wasn't that many miles away from where I live, I got more frightened and I went out and I got myself a gun. And I have it in my house to defend myself. And as soon as he sat down, one African-American man stood up, quite upset, and looked at him and he said, who are you going to shoot with that gun? He said, I know who you're going to shoot. He said, who are you going to shoot? Are you afraid of me? Are you afraid of the black men in the streets? He said, I want to tell you, you want to be afraid of somebody. Look at the people who just bombed Iraq Look at the people who made the nuclear weapons that have now proliferated around the world that destroyed the Native American people in this country. He said, you want to be afraid of somebody, look in the mirror. It became very hot and there was this intense thing that was going on in the room, which was fine. It was supposed to happen. People were supposed to say where they were coming from. And finally, Ralph Steele, who was a, a fine teacher of Vipassana, a uh, Vietnam vet and an African-American man, a psychologist from New Mexico who was there. All this was people were getting very heated. And finally Ralph stood up and he said, I just want to tell you about guns. He said, I was in Vietnam. He said, and you don't want a gun. He said, you don't want what I have. You don't want the memories of a gun in your hand because you've got to live with them for the rest of your life. You don't want the memories of what a gun does to another person. He said, you've got to live with those memories for the rest of your life. He said, you don't even want to know about guns. He said, where I was, he said, I saw stuff I don't even want to tell you about. He said, there was a man in our company, a human being. He didn't say a man. He said it with a kind of strange respect that he has for everything. He said, there was a human being in our company who specialized in shooting children. And we didn't know what to do with him, whether it would be better to shoot him or not. He said, he looked at this man, he said, you don't want a gun. So, it is an important question for our society and our lives. How do we touch our fear, our grief, the fear of loss, our own aggression and anger? Do we stuff it? Do we condemn it? Do we believe it? What do you do with it? What do you do with your inner judge? Do you have a dictator in there? Do you have your own inner police? The Iron Curtain, three strikes and you're out, inside. I don't mean this to be moralistic, because it's simply a teaching that's offered for us to use to find freedom of the heart. Is there skillful anger? 
the sword of discriminating wisdom that the Buddha carries, when is it skillful? Clarity that seeks justice. But what is taught is a reminder that what we can do in this life is rest in a truth that's greater than our fears, that's greater than those habits. In the face of all the sorrows that you will encounter inevitably, it's like Gandhi who even when someone came to shoot him, this man came and had a gun and was about to shoot Gandhi and couldn't do it one of the times before he died. And then he was captured with the gun. And he confessed to Gandhi. He said, I was going to shoot you, but I couldn't do it. And they were dragging him away. And Gandhi said, oh, my dear, what will happen to that poor man now? Imagine that as a response to somebody that was going to kill you. So that when Gandhi was finally shot, the words on his lips were, dear God, what will be the words on your lips? This is from Gandhi. Let our first act every morning be a resolve such as this. I shall not fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only that which is sacred. I shall not bear ill will toward anyone. And I shall not submit to injustice. I shall conquer untruth by truth. I shall conquer hatred by love. And in resisting untruth, I shall bear all sufferings and bring freedom of spirit to my own heart and all those that I touch. That's quite a prayer to make in the morning. And yet it speaks to a possibility for us. And every time that we sit or that we pay attention there is in this teaching or psychology the opportunity to understand the forces of the heart and to discover what leads to sorrow, entanglement, loss, and what leads to freedom and the great compassion of a Buddha, which is you and your own birthright as much as anyone on earth. How much compassion can you find for the frightened of the world the oppressors and their victims both. How much compassion can you find to bring freedom to your own heart, your own life? 